All right, let's go. Make sure you subscribe, click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon, like us on Facebook and Instagram. Hi all and welcome to the first MRT Breakwater Branch live stream. I'm Dameron from MRT aka Dazzy J. Hey everybody, it's Dan. How you going, Dan? Dan? From Rick. You hearing me there, Doing Dan? Doing well. Yeah, a little bit of a delay, but you know, I'm on the other side of the world. Excellent. So, as you well know, we got Dan from Breakwater Branch. Now, I'm hoping this audio is working okay. Um, it seems to be, for some reason, we're not... going properly here with our audio but we'll, we will forge on so hopefully uh people are are getting this if not i will pump that up and we'll see what's we're not getting any audio output for some reason but anyway we'll forge on so as as we all know we've got dan pugach from the breakwater branch um connecting the main shore to the world model railway in ho so, as I said, this is our first live stream, so I'm sort of hoping we are going live here properly. Uh, this is first for me and first for Dan, I think, on YouTube as well. So, um, so just a, bit, a little bit of housekeeping. So, I would just like everyone to have some fun and ask some questions if um, you're logged in there. So, what we're going to do is start with the Q&A question. So, Dan, um, you mentioned that you grew up around the hobby with your father owning a, a hobby store now this would be the dream of most of us listening and there's a bit of a, an ongoing joke here with us australians that it'd be like marrying a lady whose father owns a brewery yeah so, that would not be so bad so tell us what it was like growing up in the industry because obviously you you lived it and now you're, you're back into it Oh, totally. So my father started with model trains long before I was born. And he opened up a hobby store when I was in first grade, and it closed when I was in fifth grade. And it was awesome. It was called Benji's Easton Hobbies. It was in Easton, Massachusetts, where I grew up, which is probably about 15, 20-minute drive south of Boston. Um, it was really cool to go to the warehouses with him, and he could actually pick the different things he wanted on the shelves, and I could you know, give a little feedback. That looks cool, Dad. we got to have that. Uh, but it definitely was a kid in a candy shop. Uh, I had them on the train. I had Dungeons and Dragons minifigures. I had remote, Maya remote control cars that you had to build like a kid. Um, life was pretty awesome until the recession hit in. And, you know, things get in the way. So he stopped working in the shop. And then he went back into the Navy where he finished a pretty expensive career. Oh, lovely. Um, so, what type of modeling supplies did he have? Obviously, you touched on briefly, but I think you mentioned something about um, sort of some specific items, some roadway items or something that he produced. Yeah, totally. So, he carried everything a hobby shop would. He did baseball cards, model kits, model trains, uh, all that. But he also had his own business. And I actually have the last of Remnants. I he had his own business called Roadway Specialties, and Roadway Specialties made HO scale parking lots, HO scale roads. All we have left is about 150 parking lots in my basement here. Uh, all the roads are long gone. He did it in N. He did it in O scale as well. It was pretty cool for the time. Uh, I got one here that's out of the package. The foam, pretty pretty thin foam, uh, a quarter inch. Uh, thick. The back is peel and stick. So you really just peel off this plastic and stick it right down like a sticker. Uh, they were designed 
for uh, Walter's cornerstone buildings, so they already had the dimensions built in. Uh, but for this time, it was no one else did this. Uh, the foam is similar to what pool noodles are made out of today. Um, but yeah, I wish he still made these because other people make a similar product, and he hasn't sold these in quarter inch, almost thirty years. Uh, so if you need one, I still got the original. And you know, we've got the one still in the packaging that's got my parents' home address and phone number still on the back of it. You can call my dad up, and I'll tell you he doesn't sell them anymore. Why are you calling me? That's really, really cool. So, as I said, that'd be like marrying a lady that his father owns a brewery, all, all honesty. So, um, now, I'm hoping that uh, appears that we might be having some trouble with audio. Um, I'm, we're hearing you're, you okay, apparently, but not me for some reason. So, um, which is not, didn't happen in our tests. So, we might just go... Let me log into into Facebook here quickly. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, I can see the chat. That's cool. So there is chat happening, is there, on it? No, there's no chat, but there's the window that says welcome to the chat room. So if anybody is listening, yeah. throw some questions in there. So for some reason, it's... not the audio is not working so we might have to as i said my, my my microphone's working fine and i'm getting the audio with you dan but for some reason the audio for me is not going on an output interesting well when we tested about an hour ago you called me and this time i called you on skype so i wonder if uh yeah that um, might be it yeah you're using a device that no, it says, yeah, it yeah. says on my end you're recording and everything. Yeah, it says we're, we're live. I'm just going to, yeah, my daughter's actually monitoring this. So I might just go and see what she's hearing the other end. So. Okay. The trials and tribulations, huh? Exactly. If we were really good at this, we'd get paid for it. I know. You're right there. So Nobody can complain about free entertainment on a uh, Saturday night or for you Sunday morning. All right. So it appears that she can hear me, but for some reason it's not showing on my audio. So we will forge on. So cool. You can just keep checking things. All right. So let's just keep going. All right. The show must go on live television, as they say. <laughs> okay. So we've sort of touched on growing up in the hobby, just to recap. Now, also on your Facebook, I've seen that you are an avid Boy Scout, which is ultra, right. ultra awesome. So you, so I've, as I said, numerous posts with you and your lads, or your, your, your young sons. Um, you've earned a, a railroad merit badge in your, was that in your youth or was that something recently? In my youth, yeah. So I earned the railroad bear badge. My dad actually taught it to, for me and a bunch of other scouts when I was 15, 16. And um, I'm a certified instructor to teach it to scouts now as an adult volunteer. Oh, lovely. So also you, you touched on, as, a, as you said, volunteering within the scout group. So that's very local to your to where you live there in Maine or...? Yeah, so I wear many hats in scouting. I'm a Cub Master, which is the leader for the younger kids, which would be kindergarten through fifth grade. So I run scouting in our city for that grade level. I also volunteer as a district commissioner. So I help run the monthly meetings and training for all our volunteers um, in our district. And you know, I'm trying to think about how big a district is. I don't know how uh, Australia has counties. I know counties are big in uh, the United States, so our county is a district. To give you an idea, it's about 80 miles north to south and about 150 east to west. Uh, it's about 70 units, uh, scout units from all over that are in that district. I also volunteer as a at 
summer camp. I usually do a week every summer as a counselor and help out there as well. So pretty much, I love scouting. I've been, you know, I started as a Tiger Cub in first grade, went all the way to Eagle Scout, um, and I want every kid to have that same opportunity. So my nine-year-old, he's a wee blow. Uh, he's in fourth grade. Johnny, he'll be going to fifth grade next year. He'll be an Arrow Light Scout, the final year of Cub Scouts. And Wyatt will be a Lion Scout next year. He's four right now. So he'll be joining Cub Scouts in the fall, that's, which is pretty exciting. That's ultra awesome. So we, we got Scouts very similar in Australia, but I don't think it's quite as organised. Obviously, we don't have the, the population to support it like what you guys and girls do over there. So now it appears Dan, our feed is working. So a big shout out to the Dave Cruiswick and Lynn McCurdy from HO Scale Customs Podcast. We've, I think we've caught up with them, so that's ultra, ultra cool. So I think it's probably relevant or prudent for me to give a little bit of a shout out to uh, Brett Wiley and Todd Wiley of HO Scale Customs, because that's sort of how we've come to know each other, really, isn't it? So, And you've got the koozie oh, there, cool. I see, which is very, very nice. I, I like that, so... That's ultra cool. So, and the Dave Kruzik saying the beers are on you. So, unfortunately, it's they uh, are. It's quarter past nine in the morning here. So, my beer was last night when I was testing all this. So, or maybe rum, as Lynn has just put on. So, how we will forge on now? Dave Kruzik has mentioned one a question to you. What era are you modelling, Dan? Yeah, I'm, I'm modeling pretty much what leads up to my existence. I was born in 1981, and I'm modeling, say, 1975 to 85. Um, just trying to get that last of the old train ways. Uh, a caboose is my favorite train car, and they got rid of cabooses in the 80s over here in the States. So I have to have my cabooses, but I don't want it to be too far in the past. Uh, my other passions, vintage video games like Pac-Man, uh, punk rock music, the Ramones. So just catching that entire era. Well, I won't sing the Ramones, but let's hey ho, let's go, hey. Let's just move on from that. Eh? Yeah. That's, that's as good as it's going to get for me. You don't want to hear my voice at all. We've got two people well, listening in. We'll... As, long as, as long as you're not singing, I'm so bored with the USA as our closing credits. I no, think we did a good job tonight. No, no, definitely not. So. Okay, so you've you've touched on, you've gone away from the hobby, and you moved into Dungeons and Dragons, Warhammer Forty K, I think it is. Um, so I suppose the question is because I've got into a lot of YouTube of late with Warhammer type people and what they can offer to our hobby with it regarding painting miniatures so what what have you brought across from sort of that sort of niche little hobby to, to model railroading i think the big thing that i've learned is from that was kit bashing uh when i got into doing war miniatures in high school and post college a lot of it was taking things and modifying it or making stuff from scratch like the first diorama i did i took the plastic container that a birthday cake came in and I cut it open, and I went out in the woods, and I got some sticks, and I made it look like a mine shaft, and I did the old-fashioned uh, newspaper plaster to make it into a mountain, and I had this big, crazy orc kind of blocking it so that nobody could get in. Uh, and just taking those thoughts. I love doing model kits, but I'm at the point where I'm going to stop buying model kits. I feel bad because I'm friends with some kit manufacturers. But I'm at the point where I just want walls. I want my imagination to go crazy. Uh, so just taking that as well as painting techniques. When I was a kid, we painted with these horrible, horrible bottles, glass bottles of testers paint. It was nasty. You know, brush strokes everywhere, super high gloss. So learning how to dry brush, learning how to use these craft paints uh, more effectively and just bringing it into the hobby. That's that's really cool. So one of the ones I've been watching, if anyone's sort of interested, is um, a YouTube, well, there's two of them. It's the Terrain Tutor, who's a, a, an English lad, and also Luke's APS, which is another one. So um, that's I've got a lot of more budget sort of tips because that's uh, sort of where he's 
expertise or where his channel sort of goes. So now Lim McCurdy is listening out there. And he has sort of said to us, the High Desert Modular Model Railroad Club is now watching. So a big shout out from South Australia, Australia, and Maine, Port, Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine, how am I going? Yeah, Portland, Maine, yeah. in the US of A. So big shout out to you, all you guys and girls at the High Desert. Yeah, and those Limicu- High Desert folks are very inspiring. Um, I've been Facebook friends with Lynn for probably about two years now. Um, and we talk quite a bit. Um, to each other and the stuff that he shares like those guys and gals he's with out there do amazing work the one guy i think his name's benito who does uh, naval warships just blows my mind yeah that's awesome you know so one of these days when uh, the world settles down i need to i need to get on the west coast and meet him in person actually see that layout in action yeah that's right so um what we'll try to do here, Dan, obviously we're getting a few questions coming as well. So sure. I'm trying to, we'll temper with the, the questions that you and I have sort of come up with and obviously Dave Cruz, we explored another one in. So we'll go for that. Um, and then we'll just, we'll chop and change around if you're happy with that, mate. So, um, so, oh, absolutely. so Dave Cruz Wick, um, we'll put this one out to you, Dan, and maybe I can answer the same question at the same time. So from Dave, it is, when did you first learn about George's, F and SM. I'm assuming that's kits. Mm-hmm. Well, the Frank FSM kits and the Franklin South Manchester layout. Uh, I honestly had no clue about either until I started talking to all you guys through the podcast. Um, you know, talking to everybody on Facebook, and they're all talking about George, George, George. Like who? George. Like, I don't know George. Uh, I've really just lived under a rock. Like, you know, I don't subscribe to the magazines. I've always been a lone wolf. And, you know, if you didn't live in a 10-mile radius of a house, I didn't know you existed for a while. Uh, so when I started doing the research, I was like, oh, well, that's cool, but it's old-fashioned. And when I say old-fashioned, it's, it's the decade. You know, he's modeling the 1930s, 40s. It doesn't really appeal to me. But then Dave Kruzwick organized a trip, and we all, a bunch of us met in person uh, last June, and we saw George's thing in person, and I still am not done absorbing all of that. It's just, it's been overwhelming. It, you, I look at my stuff, and I say, okay, well, I did this, and he did this. Maybe I can do something a little bit different. Um, so it's kind of like going to Disneyland for a model railroad. Yeah. Um, I suppose, Dave, to answer your question, when did I find out about George? Is obviously through HA Scale Customs, the podcast as well. So um, I just recently got into podcasting probably not long after I, I sort of joined and got into the group. However, I, as Dan has just pointed out, I'm a bit of a lone wolf model living in a small country town in South Australia, Australia. So for that, I knew nothing of George. Um, surprisingly, considering I used to subscribe to Model Railroader magazine and never really, I can't remember ever seeing George uh, Selios's work in that magazine. So, um, and obviously I enjoy Dave's almost daily photos. Good morning, everyone. Um, that's just sort of you wake up for the day and it inspires you. So that gentleman is off the charts so he would be definitely for dave cruiswick he's got another question there who are your mentors so i'll just continue on so obviously george would be one of them of recent times but i'm predominantly i won't take dan's too much of dan's thunder away because he's going to flip the the tide on me very very uh as we get through these some some of these questions um about who my ment- my modeling mentors are. So I might just leave that one to you, Dan, because I reckon that's probably one question you're going to ask me, I think, from memory. So when we had a chat. Mm-hmm. Well, I, when it comes to model railroading, I feel like there's a few different ways um, you can look at your mentor. I, obviously, we have our Facebook group as Patreons of a podcast that we all interact with, and there's so many talented people on there that just take the hobby to a level I never thought possible. 
We've got Jason Jensen, who has an amazing eye for color. We've got Jake Johnson, who just creates all sorts of things. And, like, just kind of, he can take something and just replicate it. The way he, you know, I've been to Arizona, Tombstone. I've seen the Birdcage Theater, and I've seen his model. And you can't tell it's a model. You think it's a photo of the real thing. Dave Krusek, who asked this question, I call him the king of detail parts. I'm always afraid I put too many detail parts on a building or in a scene. I don't do nearly as much as him, and his never look crowded. So everybody's an influence. Um, but then there's the other part of the hobby where it's, you know, the train, because my Facebook friends are all about structures. They're not really into the train so much. So there's the local train guys like Tim Swenson, who owns Main Model Works, the hobby store about 20 minutes north of me. It's walking distance from work, which is super dangerous on your lunch break during good weather. Uh, his weathering is insane. He does this technique to make rust where it's physical, 3D rust. Like, you think he, his trains are metal and sat outside all winter, and then he brought them in and just kind of dried them off. Um, I wish I remember his name. I quit Instagram over a year ago, but there's this guy down in... Um, Florida. Uh, if you follow model train people, you know him as the guy who does graffiti art and has dreadlocks, but never really puts out his real name because he's a graffiti artist. But his train scenes are got me into this whole shelf layout movement. Um, you know, the version of my layout, and I can try to walk around with a laptop if need be to kind of show you guys, but Daz has got the photos going every now and then. Um, Shelf layouts were something I would never consider until I saw how background, a good background structure with a good skyline and just learning how to do that. Lance Meinheim for track planning. So we could talk on and on, which is good because I know you want to do this maybe monthly or so. So but we could talk for an hour just on one of my influences. Yeah, that's that's... You're exactly right there. Um, I suppose that's one of the reasons I love this hobby so much. There's so many facets to it. You know, the HO scale guys, as you drink your beer, I'm very jealous. But it's too early in the morning for me to have a beer. Um, Not everyone uh, would like it. It's, uh, it's cranberry beer. Oh, which wow. some, people, some of our friends say, uh, Bob Johnson said, that sounds gross. But I'm from Massachusetts, and cranberry is the uh, state fruit. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, um, v varying mentors for me as well. As I said, um, a German landscape artist by the name of Joseph Brandl. Not many Americans probably would have heard of him. However, his landscaping model Rare and HO is just off the charts. It's absolutely phenomenal. So so much so he's done a coffee table book and he actually makes the models look pretty ordinary to be quite honest with you so particularly the trains he's not so much into the scratch building side of things but the actual physical models and some of the, as you probably well know as as well as the american stuff some of the, the detail coming into these models these days is phenomenal so um yeah so he's he's definitely one of mine so um lynn mccurdy um just to touch on dan what you said before about benny or benito has two battleships and a fleet of naval ships uh, carriers that have planes with operating props on it. Just sharing, you saying so that's that would be phenomenal to see, actually. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a navy brat, so I eat that stuff up. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't go vegan in high school, I'm not vegan anymore, but I was for 13 years, and that pretty much what stopped me from joining the navy back in the 90s. So Dave Cruzwick's got another question, but it's sort of touches mm -hmm. very nicely into the next question I have for you. So yeah. um, moving, uh, you know, move ahead a number of years, the Breakwater Branch Freelance HO scale is the, the latest venture that you're looking at. Now, obviously we can see it over your back shoulder there and it's quite well documented on some of the photos and it's coming along really nicely. So mm -hmm. my question to you is about that is, how did you come up with the name? That's... Yeah, that's super easy. Um... So I live in South Portland, Maine. Uh, what separates me from Portland proper is the Casco Bay. And that's where all the tanker ships come in from all over the world, uh, delivering goods 
to the United States. There's a one-mile bridge that separates me from Portland. Um, and we have a lighthouse, Breakwater Light. Uh, it's commonly known as Bug Light. That's its nickname because it attracts lots of bugs in the summertime. Uh, but that lighthouse is the entrance to Casco Bay, where I live. Um, this is a freelance layout, so all I really take from it is the name and a few other elements. Uh, but this railroad used to exist during um, World War One, World War II. Uh, they used to build the Liberty Ship, uh, these big, massive Navy ships used in World War II. And the bike path, which is about a 1,000 feet from my house and paved over, was the train track that connected it to the freight yard a couple of miles down the road. Yeah, that's awesome. So it's funny you say that. We've got quite a number of bike paths here using old railway um, lines particularly sort of in more the rural parts of our state in South Australia and I love getting out there and so on you can obviously still see some of the railroad infrastructure or where at least where the the civil engineering side of it you know that the earthworks was and um, it's just a lovely through the vineyards and all that uh, that it is now but um, so D Dave Cruz Cruzwick's question is you, you touch Dan you touched on scratch building before what other skills do you hope to build on in the breakwater branch? That's a really good question. Yeah, I want I want it to be a learning railroad. Um, it is actually version four, I believe. I forget what I wrote down here. It's been a lot over the years, but um, I started out doing a four by eight sheet of plywood, which turned into three four by eight sheets of plywood in a U shape, which then got torn down. That was then going to be this massive modular layout, uh, 12 feet by 10 feet, all with two foot by four foot module. I gave up after building three of them. I said, this is just too much. I'm going too big. I'm not going to ever finish this. Uh, so then I just said, all right, small bookshelf that I got at Ikea. It's 28 inches by 11 feet. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, and it's just, I need to learn. Like I, I laid track and it wasn't good and I ripped it up, and I laid it, and I ripped it up. And now my track is super smooth. I use Code 100 Atlas track. It's all flex track and custom line switches, and I can just slightly push any of my rolling stock, and it will just fly down to the other end. Um, I never have any... So that was good just to learn how to do it. As the picture we have here um, that I see on my side with some of the trains... I did a pretty rough job cutting the water seam. So it's just, you know, I could have threw that shelf away, bought another wooden shelf for $10. But no, it's a learning process. I'm going to learn how to do a retaining wall, which will make that go away at some point. Uh, I'm learning how the electricity works. Everything is a process because before I started on this venture, almost it'll be three years in December coming up, uh, to me, model trains was a starter set in a circle, and that was it. Uh, so I want to I want to get better at everything. I want to learn operations. I want to make um, my next railroad one day. Will I'll handle all my track. Uh, so everything will always be improving on what I've done so far. Uh, I definitely have a lot of buildings with the stakes on them, but it's part of life. Well, that yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I'm layout number three, I think it is. Um, particularly this layout, there's at times of I'm twelve years into the build, so to speak. So to its current form. So to give you some sort of idea, I've gone big is not always better. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. mine's quite a large layout uh, that my father and I. Ha we're building but obviously he's now um quite elderly so he can't help me anymore so i'm hoping my kids can come along as i turn around and over my back my shoulder here and tell my eight-year-old that he needs to step up a little bit <laughs> so um, i need to learn how to do that yeah i'm so afraid and it's like i want both my kids want to operate the trains they want to yeah. build stuff and i'm so terrified because i've come home from work and I go downstairs and the four-year-old Wyatt is in the basement holding a $300 sound locomotive. Yeah. And I'm just like, what are you doing? Yeah. Or he's dropping broken rolling stock. And, yeah. you know, but if I don't let him do it, then he's going to not 
following the hobby. My dad was so great how no matter how many times I touched something I shouldn't or broke something, I never got yelled at for it. And I find myself being overprotective, and I really need to change that and let my kids come down, spend time, learn what I'm doing, watch me make and then watch how I correct them. And it's like, oh, well, I broke that, but now I can just go through my box of parts and I can cut a new wall, and I'll make it even better idea than we originally had. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, my little lad back in the day, he was still in his crib, um, I painted up some some resin kits that I made, painted them up all to the the local well, Australian National Railway, which is now defunct, but sort of it's a real green and gold colour, and I painted all up all the nice bent the grab irons and the the shunner steps and everything was on there, all brass, and it was all lovely uh, until I left them too close to him when he was probably about a year old, climbed out of his crib onto the workbench and just pretty well destroyed him, but. Um, as you say, what what can you do? You know, it's okay. twelve months old. Um, that's my fault for leaving them so close. I think, but that's my little story. I, th- I think I did put that up on the <laughs> the Facebook post. Um, Ho at some Ho scale customers at, at one point, but um, yeah. So what's you've sort of touched on a little bit but we'll now we'll sort of niche it down here a little bit what's what are the future plans for the breakwater branch uh big thing is structure structure structures i have so many structures in progress because i see something i buy it i start building something something else catches my fancy or i just want to do it for a different reason so i really need to just finish all these buildings. I have an 11 foot long layout. That's a lot of background buildings I need to do. I have a two foot by two foot square city, which is going to be a city block where I'll have, you know, buildings all on the outskirts, like a square, but then I'm also going to have buildings in the middle. So cars will drive completely around the buildings in the middle, 360 degrees. So just getting all of that put together Thankfully, I work in IT. Um, I'm working from home till further notice. Uh, it's like many people, so I work from home in the basement. I can, you know, take breaks and, you know, it's like, oh, I can paint this wall and then go back to work and then take a temp break and now I'll weather the wall. And, you know, so I'm hoping that I'll have a lot more done. I joked around with my boss last night saying, the layout is going to be completely done by the time we're back in the office, which we know that's not going to happen. A layout is never done. No, that's right. There's always Jason Jensen's definitely a, a proponent of that. Just the amount of detail. I just watched one of his videos last night um, on uh, super sort of super super detailing sort of some of his his sort of wharf areas, boat shed, and that, and it's just next level stuff. Um, inspiring, which is it fantastic. is so. I love watching his videos. I, so. I love it too. It, and it's cool because me and Jason somehow are connected mentally. Everything I want to do, he does. So it's like I think about building a certain type of kit and I'm just waiting for my next paycheck to buy the supplies and then boom, there's a YouTube video on how to do it. It's like, how'd you know I wanted to do that? Uh, same thing with color choices. So it's, it's kind of cool that he's doing all this and then I can look at it and get inspired and still do it my way and i gotta catch up on those videos it's hard you know how it is with kids like i listen to all my podcasts in the car commuting but youtube i probably haven't watched many in the past year uh so i need to start cranking those out yeah you definitely do um particularly that model railroad uh techniques bloke he's a bit of a good good lad i hear so (laughs) i heard it's a good show um they don't some no reason it's blocked in my country. We can't watch it. No, no, no. That's just taking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I think why you and I hit it off on Facebook because we were willing to get, it's an Australian term, but get stuck into each other, have a bit of a laugh at each other's expense, yeah. so to speak. So I think it's it's all part of the hobby and I. that's yeah. definitely my my personality. Some people take me the wrong way because I think they think I'm giving them a hard time, so to speak. But it's just my humour, being I, I like people. So. I 
I communicate with my wife not by text message, but we send animated gifts to each other and can have complete conversations. Uh, so I know how you're saying it. And also, it's like you and I, we're okay with going into these groups of very talented and experienced people and saying, hey, we're newbies and we don't really know much about this and what you're doing. Um, you know, I'm never afraid to ask questions. And it's been worth it. You know, we've talked about a lot of guys that inspire us and that we talk to online. I've been able to have you know, sit down and have a beer with Jason Jensen. Like, I would never thought that would happen. Right. Like, you think, oh, that's like a, that's like a celebrity. And now I know if you probably get super humble. He's like, no, 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 I'm not. But it's like, it felt, it felt that way. Yeah. It felt like I was, you know, having lunch with a bunch of uh, model railroad rock stars. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So unfortunately my neck of the woods, we've got people probably not, I wouldn't, Australian model row rating is a bit different. Obviously, we've only got 25 million people to start with, so that there's less of us to go around, so hence more the lone wolf side of things. But um, So that's, yeah, I would love to. But you'll touch on a sec that hopefully we're getting over there later in the year, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So, uh, Dave Kruiswick has sent in another question for you. Um, is there still a model row rating merit badge? Are scouts still responsive to it? Um, yeah, so we touched on it a little bit, I think, before Dave came in. I've got the, the book right here. It's now called Railroading. Uh, when I was a scout, and I assumed Dave was, or maybe one of his kids were a scout because he asked about it, it was model railroading only, and that's the one that I earned. Uh, but the one that they have now, you can do model railroading, or you can do rail fanning, uh, or you can do a hybrid of both to meet the requirements. Um, there are not too many. Like in here, I can just list off a couple of them, uh, just so you guys get an idea. Um, you know, no different types of modern freight trains. Know the difference between class one and class two. Um, build a structure. Build a uh, rolling stock kit. Uh, know the no type, um, design your own layout, or make a diorama. So it's definitely doable, and hopefully everything goes well. We're because I live in the land of trains for the Northeast. We're going to put on a crazy event for scouts in the fall. The original plan was to do it in June, but we pushed it back. And you know, I live right next to the largest freight yard north of Boston, Massachusetts. We've got Amtrak. We've got multiple. Uh, tourist railroads. We've got the main two-foot narrow gauge. We've got the Seashore Trolley Museum. That's got trolleys from all over the world. Uh, we've got the Wiscast Railroad. So we're trying to connect with all these different organizations, Operation Lifesaver, so I can put on an event for the kids. They can earn the merit badge. They can sleep over at a train station. Uh, on their time, I'll have them sleep on the trains. They can learn safety. They can learn signals. Um, they, and they can just have an entire weekend of everything trained. And, you know, it's obviously hard when you're working with 5-year-olds to 18-year-olds, so we got to find activities for different age groups. Yeah, that's really cool. But I, I sort of think, and that's not so much for the kids, I think it's more for Dan. <laughs> it is. Uh, so a little history, uh, in my hometown... Uh, of Easton, Massachusetts, there is a historic uh, train station. Um, it was designed by Olmsted, who is a famous architect. He did Central Park in New York. He's really big into um, you know, brownstone-type buildings. And this old um, railroad, the old colony railroad, went from Boston down to Rhode Island. And that was in the times of you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, when transportation changed and people weren't just using trains and boats to get everywhere, it closed. My parents bought that house in 1974, I think, thinking under the assumption, under the the, rooms, the, uh, the rumors that that train line was going to reopen. It is going to reopen, but it's not going to reopen for a couple more years, which is, you know, 50 years after they bought that house. Um, but they are going to reopen that line that goes from Boston down to Rhode Island. Uh, so I grew up where I could see the train station from my driveway. Um, basically, you know, grew across the street from a pond, 
you look out the door at the pond and then on one of the sides of the pond, not straight across is the train station. Um, so anytime I can be around train tracks, I go out of my way to do it. Yeah, that's another thing we have in common. I had uh, over my back fence, basically where I grew up in um, a suburb in south of Adelaide, South Australia, um, was the main line, what would you you would call a class one, I would think, with between uh, Adelaide and Melbourne, so the, the eastern seaboard, so it was quite a quite a major route that sort of came through at that point in time. So uh, another big shout out, we've just got another lad come online, Brad Anderson from the Model Railroad Down Under, so another Aussie, so welcome aboard. Um, he says, well done guys, love this side of the modelling community. Uh, like you said down here, Australia, it's a bit lone wolf. Social media has bridged like-minded people. Um, yeah, that's definitely the case. Hence why we're doing this in this crazy, crazy world that's happened in the last week or so. I think uh, this, probably these type of interactions, I think are going to be more and more, I would think. So uh, I'm seeing on Facebook that, uh, you know, train shows are getting cancelled left right and center from ones here in australia timonium i saw the other day also um obviously they'll they'll reopen up again at some stage but this crazy world where we're currently in with this silly silly virus that thing that's going on um everyone's been ultra cautious which is understandable but we won't get into the politics side of things it's model road model trains we want to talk about so well see my train how close are you to trains now Um, probably a 45 minute drive, I would think, would be the closest I would be. No, 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 30 minutes. So I, I live up in the, the Adelaide Hills. So there's a commuter line that near where I work that goes from, comes from Adelaide to the southern suburbs of South Australia, um, or Adelaide, I should say. So, so it's good 30 minutes, but that's not freight. That's just purely rail cars, electrified rail cars. Um, mm -hmm. probably to go to that same freight line to where I used to live is probably a 45 minute drive. So, but I'm not, I'm a bit strange. If, if there's a, a big freight train going by, I'll have a look and I'll, I'll be in awe of it, but I've never been a big one for the prototypes for some reason. I, I, I'm not sure what it is. I don't, you know, as a young lad with my grandpa, I used to, uh, watch the, the trains the same track but further down the line towards adelaide but of recent times i definitely haven't um watched a lot of prototype trains I, I, apparently i have cool headphones why it wanted to say hello hello lads hold on mate hello darren you here now hello mate say hi louder hi hello <laughs> You're talking to uh, someone all, right. all the way in Australia. I can't say no more. You're talking to someone in Australia. Ooh, Ooh Johnny, you going to say hi? I knew I was going to get bombarded. Hi. Hello. That's cool. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. He said he knows you. He knows me. Well, well, that, is that a good thing? Yeah, he knows you. <laughs> no stranger on, danger with that one. He, he touches, uh, touches on that australian like is my, my camera's up the right way isn't it that seems to be the ongoing joke in the podcast so i had to, I had to flip it upside down because you know we're being the down on uh, the land of down under so we we talked about this earlier i'm going to rotate the uh, the children are helping themselves to the layout right now <laughs> so dad's, um, uh, dad's anxiety is going up a little bit johnny's trying to use the throttle but little does he know it's not wired up yet <laughs> That might be a good thing if Dad's not right next time. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, uh, animals are loose. The animals are loose. No, oh, that's good. That's but yeah, awesome. we're really close to trains. Uh, I do DCC now. I did give in after two years into the hobby. But I joked around that I would never need DCC because we live a thousand feet from where the container ships come in and all the containers are put on flat cars. And we've got commuter rail as well. So I hear trains all the time from my house. And it's very exciting. I get really giddy at, you know, 11 at night or 5 in the morning and I hear a train go by. <laughs> That's fantastic. Sorry. 
So it's probably a, a reasonable segue. What we're Dave Cruz, Cruzwick's coming up uh, has come up with another another awesome question. So, um, which is going to segue into some other questions I have for you, probing into to Dan, so to speak, if that's appropriately to say. Um, um, so Dave Cruzwick, how much uh, scenery experience have you accumulated? Any neat features, water, gullies, uh, planned for the breakwater? Well, my experience doing scenery is gluing really horrible, cheap, green grass uh, onto plywood, and that's about it. Um, but Breakwater Branch is a ton of scenery. Um, it's broken down into little four scenes, and each scene is about just two, three by three, two feet by three feet. And uh, so I've got the harbor scene, and there will be water in the lighthouse. I have the start of a city scene where you have a really steep incline going up um, to drive up to the top because you've got the trains going through two tunnels and then you're going to have uh, the city on top of those tunnels and then you have the city scene and then when you leave the tunnels, there'll be a little more country. Um, so I'm a, you know, rocky cliffs, water, um, trees. I'm thinking of going with the fall. I live I live in Maine. It's the pine tree state, so lots of pine trees. Uh, but it's not going to be super scenic because I also want it to still have that urban feel. Uh, when I first did the track plan, there was going to be a lot of street running. Um, street running, if I'm not using the right term for the it might be called something else. To me, street running is like trolley tracks where you just see the rails and you don't see the tires. So you just that's all pavement, asphalt. Um, and you know, as I'm learning these skills, the next layout will be even further. Uh, I'm really digging trackside scenery photo backdrops, so I've been trying to figure out which ones I would get. I need about three of them to do my entire background and hide the ugly hundred-year-old walls that are peeling. 1950s of green paint. <laughs> they they are Johnny is uh, Johnny is trying really hard. He plugged the power in, but Johnny, I think I fried the decoder. I don't know what I did wrong. I've never programmed a decoder, and it worked great at address number three. And I borrowed a lock sound uh, pro a lock pr programmer from my friend Nick. So, uh, from Decoder Buddy. He's in Vermont. So he can't, he was in the area. I borrowed his programmer. I programmed the locomotive from 3 to 229. It works great on the test track. He left my house at 930 at night to go back to Vermont. Next day, well, the NCE throttle doesn't detect the locomotive at all. So until I buy one of those programmers or he comes to visit again, my one and only locomotive sits silent and quiet. Let me put the my microphone back on. I have some experience with the the ESU decoders, so we might offline. I'll we'll have a bit of a play around with it, maybe at some stage if you want to, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. I was just unplugging it because I didn't want there to be like some kind of. I, if I didn't fry it, I didn't want there to be some kind of track shortage. And yeah, it doesn't sound like you have, it doesn't sound like you have fried it. If you've if it's been installed in and you've had success with it on the programming track. Sounds like something you might have to yeah. go back to uh, the default factory mode or something like that, but we can we can have a look at that. Yeah. So. yeah. So, and you know, my birthday at the end of the month, so I'll just have to get myself a programmer. You will. Now, you did touch on that briefly with your with your wife that you send. You don't communicate via sort of emojis and the like, and you send each other little gift card type things electronically. Yeah. So what is the, in the, the Pugak household, what is the, the going uh, emoticon or emoji or call it what you will when you go and buy something from the model train shop or get something online? Uh, Does she know straight um, away if it's uh, something train related by, did you get sort of the, yeah. the, the look down, the frown that we all get? <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword because 
the first side of the sword is she's a family accountant. Uh, she so she knows where every penny goes. And then the other side of it is she works from home because she's self-employed. So the packages arrive on the doorstep, and she knows about it for two hours before I get home. I had a, a boss that I used to work for. He was into uh, expensive watches, and he used to get everything delivered to work. And I, he'd retired recently, and so we get off track here a little bit. But I went and visited him. I still see him socially outside of work since he's retired. And I, I mentioned this. I said, where do you get all your watches sent? And his wife turned around and said, what do you mean, what watches? So I, I got him in the, in the trouble good and proper. But he did deserve it because mm. he was buying some ridiculously expensive watches considering yeah. I'm the sort of person you got one hand. You can only wear one at a time. But mm -hmm. then he's, then rightfully he probably turned around and says, well, how many trains can you run at one time? And I said, well, I can run a lot. So, but so, all right. One more than I have. That's right. So but yeah, no, it's, I, I went crazy when I first got into the hobby and I was buying rolling stock left and right. So I was buying probably, I don't know, two or three uh, train cars a week and on eBay used, and that was a problem. But now, you know, I put myself on a budget of 50-ish dollars a month, and that seemed to work pretty well. Which is why the Australian dollar's going right down is about 25 cents, so. <laughs> yeah. I can I can buy, like, one structure kit, one laser-cut structure kit a month. Oh, that's, fair. that's an awesome segue. You must be reading the questions, so. Okay. No, they're small. I'm like an old, old lady trying to read those. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, I'm keeping a, a, board, a, a broad of all the questions that are coming in. So keep them coming, guys and girls. It's fantastic. So I suppose the, the next logical question is, uh, we've been just touched on structures, as you just said. Um, you mentioned that you started out building plastic kits which yeah. we all do. And now you've moved across to Craftsman Kits. Mm -hmm. Talk us through why you've gone down this path. Uh, I started going down that path because I, I bought plastic because that's all I knew. And it was really hard to put plastic kits together. Maybe I bought the wrong glue. I used Gorilla Glue. I got the gel and it wasn't working. Probably also because I'm in Maine and it gets below zero in the winter. Uh, really frustrated with how they kept falling apart, weren't sticking together. Really good at sticking my fingers together, sticking walls together. Uh, I always avoided craftsman's kits because of the price. I thought even $35 was ridiculous. And now I think 100 is a bargain. Uh, but I did the group build a year ago. It was uh, February of 2019. And that group build we did with HL Scale Customs, uh, Brett, uh, Todd, Dad Todd, and Jason Jensen would each build the same kit the same night. That was the Pops kit. I'll go grab it. Uh, yeah, please do. I don't know what the kids are doing. Like, they're spinning around or skateboarding. I don't know. They're doing something. Uh, so my Pops kit, um, I built this, and everyone built the same kit. And that was cool. That's why I said, like, Jason Jensen and I were on the same page. We both went with the same color scheme, not knowing the other person was even going to do that. So this was my first foray in kits. I've never dealt with a wooden kit. Um, I made mistakes. I broke pieces, but you can't tell. Like, you guys have no idea that this tiny wall that the door goes around that I broke. I tried different mediums. I tried metal roof and car paper roof and signs. So it was just one of those things where once I did this, I was hooked and I, there was no way I could go back to plastic. I gave a lot of those plastic kits away that I started or never started. I, um, I, gave, I sold some or donated them. And it's now it's, it's wood or nothing. I did try HydroCal over the summer. I'm not really a huge fan of it. Um, but it definitely looks awesome for wood. I mean, for brick or for stone structures. If you want that realistic look, HydroCal is the way to go. It's just, I only use one glue. Uh, this is the only glue I know now. The good old tight bonds would glue. It, so if I can't glue it together with this, I don't want it. Yeah, I'm, some questions. Yeah, no, I just, I just put one out. 
Um, yeah, Lynn McCurdy's got a question there. We'll get to that that very soon. Now, I so that that kit that you just um, the the lobster kit that you showed that one there. Yep. Yeah. Um, what what brand is that? This is uh, Casey's Workshop. Oh, Casey's um, they Workshop. designed the kit for the group build. There is supposed to be another group build. Um, Todd said that it was going to be delayed a little bit. It's definitely happening this calendar year. Uh, but they built this kit specifically for HO Scale Customs fans. It's a general store. I made it into a seafood restaurant. This giant lobster I actually got for a dollar on Etsy with some laser art, and I just painted it. Uh, Ah, something about these kits. They're they're amazing. You know, and you just you learn and you, you just get better and better. You're exactly right. Um I've only built two craftsman kits, I think, so far. Mm-hmm. Um and I did a little scratch buildy thing to throw myself at that. So we'll get to that in a sec because I know you're building a craftsman kit that I did a video on, so um, so we'll get to that one in a sec, I think. So, because we're going to talk about the mecca of all kits at some point in time here that uh, you mm. highly publicised on on your Facebook post. So, sorry, I was bragging, but it was one of those no, moments no, where I thought it never happened. So uh, this is probably going to. I want to see your body language as soon as I say this phrase: fine scale model kits. No! <laughs> like, Send shivers down Dan's yeah. spine. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, you know. Okay. It's funny you yeah, say that because I've I've sort of written. Yeah, there there it is. Um, you smell it like a cigar box. It's like yeah, the wood. You smell Peabody, Massachusetts, and so we we sort of touched on. I, I saw you did the opening of that um, on your Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, page which is bwbrr at facebook and uh, which is breakwood uh, branch yeah. railway you can see it scrolling across the bottom there hopefully so just to put it in people's minds to come and like your page which is be fantastic so so fsm kits that little kit that you had out what 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 kit is that and why did you choose that one so this one is Flag Stop Station. Uh, I'll hold up the picture here. And I chose it for two reasons. One, it was the only kit I could afford. Um, this kit was originally, someone sold it on sale for $5. That's because they cropped up the price and wrote in pen on it. Um, and I got it for $51. Um, thanks to a gentleman in the FSM group who I said, where do I buy FSM kits? Which one should I do? A lot of these kits don't fit my um, decade. You know, a lot of his stuff is 50 years earlier than what I'm modeling. But I had to have one of those kits. And I was like, okay, well, let's have an old-fashioned, tiny passenger station. That would be perfect. Um, You know, if you have that passenger station... It doesn't have to be modern. It's a historical site. They wanted to keep it the way it looks. I live in, you know, where there's tons of tourist railroads all over the place, so it really makes sense. And then if it doesn't go on Breakwater Branch Railroad, it can always go on my next one, which I'm already planning, even though it's a decade away, and it's going to be narrow gauge logging closer to, like, 1800s, early 1900s. It'll be steam, um, which this would fit it perfectly with. But it was just... Yeah, it was the only kit for under a hundred dollars that would fit my layout uh, theme, and I was shocked. Like this guy on Facebook says, "Hey, this kit's fifty-one bucks," and I just went immediately and bought it. Didn't even hesitate. That's fantastic. Um, what what special plans have you got for that kit? Where's where's that going to go? Uh, I'm, it's going to be taking my time because I don't want to screw it up. Uh, but let's go. Let's get mobile for a second. I'll unplug the power from the laptop and I'll walk you guys over. So I can kind of set some stuff up because the kids kind of played with it. But it, it won't be in the harbor. It's not going to be in the start of the city. It's not going to be in the main city. There's my Wiley's kit that I, uh, I did for a contest. That's an ITLA kit. I really enjoy doing their kits with the dovetail joints because I hate 
doing um, bracing on structures. Um, if, if you want to model the inside of a structure, people are going to see it, and I'm not a fan of that. Um, and I live in a 100-year-old house where the floor gets wet. So with that, you're, my, my walls warp no matter what I do. Uh, but the kit is going to go way down over here, um, right where we have this good old crossing plate um, re wrap So we'll put the station, and I hope I got this at the right angle that you guys can see it. Yeah, so it's looking good right, here we'll, right here will be the station. Um, I also plan to put things like a, a car garage. I'm going to have a church. I'm going to have a log, the new log cabin that um, – Cowalinga Models is making. I'm buying that, and that's going to be where my Boy Scouts, because I got the prizer figures of the Boy Scouts, they're going to hang out. So this is going to be kind of like small town, and then this will be big city. This will be more industrial, and this will be all more industrial and stuff. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to bring this back. Hope I'm not making guys too dizzy. Well, that was good. Thank, thank you for the little tour. So, yeah. What are the FSM kits uh, in Dan's sites? Ah, uh, which one? Uh, I don't know. Or it, Maybe or any, uh, because it, it segues quite nicely because Dave Kruzik's come up with a "What's your favorite craftsman kit manufacturers?" So, what 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 other kits are you looking at? That's hard because that's like saying which is your favorite kid, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> We might have one or two craftsman kit manufacturers in this chat right now. Yeah. Um, I love Hopefully them all. I, I I can't say I have a favorite, but I definitely have like a top five. Uh, I do like FOS scale kit. I think he makes really rad stuff. Um, so I have bought a bunch of those. I actually got his free kit, um, which is a hobby store. And this will be my dad's Benji Easton hobbies when I put it together. Uh, living here in Maine, just down the road, about a uh, half an hour drive. Excuse me. Uh, I was uh, Bar Mills. I don't own any Bar Mills kits, but if I could, I would go on their website and add to cart one of everything in a heartbeat. Like, just do it. Like, it, I know it would be worth it. Uh, I really like the stuff coming out from Mind Mount. Uh, I haven't really, I haven't bought much of his stuff. I've been buying more of the accessory things from him, but the stuff from my mouth is really cool. And he just keeps popping out all these new things. Like I want that, I want that, I want that. Um, his Sunrise Bakery is really cool. His Randy Auto is really cool. Uh, I already mentioned something about Cowalingo uh, models, which I've just learned from a bunch of the guys here. Um, he puts out smaller kits. You know, twenty-five dollar easy basic kits, and he's come out with some cool stuff. I like some of the, the apartment building he made that's yellow, where the second floor sticks out more. Um, I've never, you know, obviously I've never built an FSM kit. This will be my first and maybe my only, um, just because of my wallet. I've never built a Campbell's kit. Um, when I, at some point, I'm going to need to build a ship, so I'll probably do um, a Seaport Model Works ship. When I put one in my heart, uh, it just goes on and on. Like I like the stuff that's come out by Crescent Creek. Uh, Jake made my control panel. Um, right now he's just doing O scale kits, um, but hopefully one day he'll make some HOs that work for me. Um, if he can't make stuff that fits my my layout, I just have to make a second layout that fits his stuff. That's kind of the way it's got to go. Um, I. Also, uh, I guess the last one that's pretty cool lately is Tin Whistle. I know Tin Whistle does pretty much plastic kits, and I've sworn them off, but I may make an exception because they make some pretty cool kits. I'm just asking them, um, how do I put these together? Yeah. Um, Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, it was. Top five dozen, we'll say. No, that's really cool. So, yeah. Lynn McCurdy, going back here a little bit, um, he did the same early on in his modeling the second time around, he's saying bought cheap, ready to run cars, then started trading and selling and upgrading. So I think that's what we all do. I'm constantly doing that, sort of going, getting stuff because I, I predominantly model European stuff. That, which is going to think strange European, but then I'm talking about American stuff. But there is, 
you, I'm sure you asked me that question, so I won't won't go go into that too much. So, but but the like like in the takeover trend, you know. Yeah, so I suppose I like also some Australian stuff or stock. Um, you probably see it on the video there. That's I used to travel to school in that very train, or one of those very trains there. Even though it's going through European scenery, so some people, some of the purists, would be having a heart attack. But anyway, that's fine. That's up to them. So, um, so yeah, my my love of the hobby or my interests vary greatly depending on if I get bored or not, really. So, yeah. and that's probably why this hobby is so so inviting. I think, from my point of view, that there's so many aspects. Like a big aspect of my layout is. I have a computer that runs it. So um, I use a, a software, a German software, that I can have about a dozen trains running independently of each other and they're not meant to run into each other. So that's that's one, you know, I'm heavily into DCC. I'm just starting to dip my toe into to the Craftsman kit side of things. So the reason I, I've, I've got into that, I was purely just looking for podcasts for my commute to work as as what you do as well dan so um and i've come across a few like uh model rail radio is one that i've called into a few times because there's some australian uh people that um are quite heavily involved in that including two of my mentors that i grew up with the model uh rail rating with helped me on my layout and also, another one is uh, A Modeler's Life with um, Lionel Strang from Canada. Yeah. Uh, I think it's hilarious. So, and obviously, then I've come across, let's have a look at HO Scale Customs, and here we are. So, yeah. um, as I, I said, would be I was terrified to answer the Kelly questions. I feel like Lionel would rip me apart. I know the right answers for N Scale. I know, say, the song Honey, but I would get those questions wrong every time. Just, Just make sure you say, yes, that's right. Honey, the song you'd have to say. What would be your superpower? That would be an interesting one. What's the what's one of the other questions? Don't say Dude, light. Don't say ketchup. light beer. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I hate ketchup, so don't worry about me putting well, ketchup, on, ketchup hot on hot dogs. Ketchup on hot as well, because we're older than that. I call so. ketchup poison. Yeah. So that's sort of where I'm at. Well, I suppose with my modelling, just delving into the craftsman kit side of things, because it's not a lot of the kits are not too too dissimilar to European kits, really depending on the locale where they're from. So I'm a little bit specific what I'll choose, but I'm about to start to build a, a harbour scene. Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the the boat that I posted up on Facebook a little while back that I'll be doing a, a video series in it. I might just, I'll show you the boat that I'm building. Hang on, I'll try not to unplug my yeah. foot. I'll try not to break it. Yeah, it's a... I don't know how well you can see that, but that's... So to give you some sort of idea, that is about twenty inches long in your in your math. So yeah. So I'll see what twenty. See that would take my entire harbor. That would crash into the lighthouse and the docks and be hanging off the fascia at the same time. So that's purely resin. Um, mm -hmm. With I don't know if you can sort of see how close I can get without pixelating it with uh, yeah. it's all brass etch it's i initially started doing a, a video series on it and i will do it but um i'm let me neatly put that down without dropping it um so that's been my latest build i've still got i've got a, a cck nickerson's landing which is a sort of a harbor scene that uh, I've got a build. I got that for my birthday recently, and I've got um, a Seaport Model Works uh, lighthouse that's coming as well, which they're not too dissimilar. So I wrote a, I read a, an interesting article about, and I wrote a little blog on it that I put on my website. Um, to obviously when you when you do prototype modeling, and please tell me, Lynn or Dave or who else is out there? Um, Brad Anderson, if you're into prototype modeling, that in some regards, that can be a lot easier to model because you're, you're modeling a locale. You, you, some people are down to a specific date in history 
whereas I'm sort of a, a, a freelance modeler as, as well as you, Dan, that we've got to try to add some sort of legitimacy, if I can spit that out, um, to our yeah. modeling. So I'm trying to come up with a written backstory to all my my locations. So all my locations are all based around family members or influential people in my life. So case in point, yeah. Um my 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 grandfather that that pretty well got me into the to this hobby. His name was Harold, so Harold Victor Harbour, so HVH is is the phrase. So and the backstory to that is that he was a he was the harbour master. He was a he was a an American gentleman. So I'm literally going to have a whole area dedicated to American type craftsman kits. So hence the Nickerson's Landing and the like. So welcome, Brett Wiley. Yeah, Brett. Just as well we didn't slag him off Brett. too much. Yeah, he's going to pay me for all this free advertising, right? Yeah, that's right. You can get your koozie for a small payment of. That's right. <laughs> Fire Dan. The koozies was... were my idea. I'm so glad he made them. Yeah. I pestered him for months to get them They're made. They're fantastic. So he's tuning in now. He's just got home. So that's that's fantastic. So what, what time is it? Your neck of the woods. We've just gone quarter past 10 in the morning here. So It is 7.46 at night. 7.46. So we're doing all right. So we're about an hour in. So we'll we'll keep forging on. Yes, we're going to turn this into a three-hour epic. <laughs> but that's fine. If people want to listen to three hours, I'm more than happy to talk about this hobby. I, I love it. So, all right. Until so, the Bluetooth headphones run out of battery. That's, yeah, well, that's, that's the, the next thing. Then I'll, you just have to hear me sing or something like that, but you don't want it. That'll turn the, the viewers off very, very quickly, I think. So now, we talked about FSM... <laughs> Your top 200 craftsman kits we sort of touched on briefly. Now, on Facebook, you started building Fisher Fuels by Railroad Kits or Jimmy Dignan. So that is obviously one that I I built and did a video on it. And I learnt so much from that kit. And there you go. Hang on. Let's transition that across. Yeah. So I just put that up again so I just so everyone can see. That's it. It's definitely a tough. I haven't done much. I've paint, all I've done is painted walls, and I glued these three walls together before we got connected. Yeah. So I'd have something to show for myself. Yeah. So if you enjoyed, obviously you haven't done much on it. So you've done all the coloring of all the walls at this point in time, or you still? I see you've done obviously you've done your bracing on that main. Yeah. Bit, but. So, you know, like I've done a lot of color. This wall still needs weathering. Um, this one has the weathering. This one does. Uh, not all the insides are black. Like this one's still naked. Um, and here we got black. But just playing around with it. And it's hard when you work on a kit and then you walk away. So I did, I painted this wall in the front of the building. And I liked it. A couple of days later, I painted the side wall doesn't really match. Front wall to me, and maybe it's just the bad fluorescent lighting, is almost a little bluish greenish more. Yeah. The side wall is a little more pinkish. I did the same thing. I used uh, alcohol and India ink stain. Let it dry. I painted it with the same bottle of almost white craft paint. Yeah. I India ink alcohol washed it again after that. But it just looks a little different. But I'll I'll keep working in, and you know I got signs to do and roofs, and it'll all come together. So I'm gonna keep trucking along. I know. Um, I... Sorry, go on. go on, Dan. Oh, just lately I haven't been able to spend much time on kits, which is gonna change obviously. Um, like you said earlier, with everything going on, so it's been a thing where I've got during the summer I come down to my basement for like an hour a week, usually on a Sunday. I'm gonna be in my basement eating. So hopefully, uh, you know, more consistency. Yeah, it's fantastic. So I know when I did that kit, um, this is the still back on Fisher Fuels, that it was the first time I even attempted to do 
a shingle roof and I mm -hmm. suck at shingle roofs. That's no two ways about it. So you'll probably see some <laughs> some parts of that video if, if anybody want, watches it. It's actually got the shingle roof on it and it looks horrendous. So I ended up pulling that out, doing the tar paper roof on the flat part of the roof and obviously the, then the pitched roof I did. What did I do? Um, I went back and did corrugated iron. So I like corrugated iron. I seem to be a little bit more successful at, at doing that. So that's what I ended up doing. I've since bought, uh, when I got Nickerson's Landing, I bought some some shingles from Jeff Grove as well. So I just need to try to look at how I'm going to do that because I, I, no matter what I did to it, I just couldn't make it look anything that resembled a roof other than a splotch of color. So... But that's fine. It's definitely a learning curve, too. So I also do things a little differently. Um, this is the back of an inside wall. I actually brace walls for my roof line because it's easier to put a roof on them. I learned that when I did the pop build and I had a hard time with the roof. Uh, I'll even put, like, a vertical piece at the peak when I get the back wall on. Um, so I did that, and then I put the side walls on, and I'm blocking the first little notch for those rafters. Um, so then I'm popping off the bracing, I'm breaking rafters, these little pieces, and I'm re-gluing those on again. So <laughs> a lot of frustration working on this kit, but it's just forced me to slow down. I can't just crank out a kit in a day. Uh, you know, there's only one person on the planet who can do that. No, that's right. We've already talked about him, Jason Jensen. Extensively, yeah. He, I know. He, he he's a great guy, but he's a... He's a machine. He's yeah, not human. Cool. I've met him. <laughs> not <Yeah>. human. <laughs> so, all right. So I've talked about Fisher Fuels by Jimmy. We've talked about me stuffing up roof lines, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, um, your chipping technique for that, how... What do you yeah. do? Totally. Um, my technique that I did, and it, it came out pretty good on here. You don't see it as well on here. You'll definitely see it more in my pop build. Um, what I do is I prime my building with dark gray spray paint. Uh, let's see. Good old, good old Rustoleum dark gray. This is ultra, ultra cover flat gray primer. So I prime everything dark gray, then I paint my white paint over it, and then when the white paint is still wet, I use paper towel like sandpaper, and I use metal files to just beat the heck out of my building. And whatever happens, happens. I tried doing the sponge technique, and I just couldn't figure it out. I know a lot of folks do a sponge technique. Oh, uh, you guys are fun yeah, at my sponge I, thing. I, yeah, I'm, I'm a sponge man. I... Learned that from Brett, um, Brett and Todd. Oh, I've tried it on some some scrap material to start with, and it just seems for me it works. So I think that's quite interesting. It's sometimes you just whatever works for the individual, like me and shingle roofs didn't work at that particular time. So I moved on to something I I knew that would work. But I would like to definitely look at more techniques. That's for sure. Oh yeah. And that's these guys. I got it in the lady section of Walmart, and they were like a dollar. Oh, uh, you got your black, which is super heavy duty, and your finer pink one. Yeah. So I use those to rough things up. These metal files, I used to use these in Warhammer. Oh. Uh, yeah, let's hold it to the picture, but I'm not holding the camera. Um, I got these at Harbor Freight. I got like 20 of them for $2. And, you know, it's just. I know a lot of guys, like Brett was talking about recently, about over weathering that people say george over weathers things but i don't know i look around i, I go outside and i see things are pretty beat up yeah. um maybe we have it lucky we i model 70s and 80s so those buildings are 30 50 years old they're gonna you're not gonna see anything look new on my layout except for automobile yeah that that's that's exactly right so it's that fine line of having a new looking building that 
looks re- looks believable, I suppose, against some of the other stuff. I think is what it comes down to. Um, and I'm still trying to, trying to learn that. Yeah, like Fisher Fuel. So, what is Fisher Fuel going to be on your layout? Uh, probably a coal merchant, as what it's sort of designed for. I'm not going to have. Obviously, on the railway kits um, website, I don't know if you've seen it. It's got like a quite a large sort of fuel storage tank yeah, sitting behind does. it on the little diorama. Yeah. But mine's purely just going to be coal because my my layout is more eras one to three European, which is all all steam. So, um, and maybe heating oil or something. I might might be the other thing I would look at back in that day, but. But for me, I figured, you know, here's the main structure. This is a house to me. I look at it. Yes, it was a business, but it looks like a residential home. And then you've got the garage that comes inside the two-bay garage. I was like, well, that could be the business. And maybe that garage was built later. So the roof isn't going to be as beat up. The paint might be a little better done. Um, I'm going to turn it into a bicycle factory because that's a career I used to have. And it'd be like, you know, just have some bicycles outside and some welding tanks. And you know, it'd be like someone just so many of those handmade bicycle guys I used to work with were one man shows. Even when I worked for one of the most the largest custom bicycle companies in the country, there was 13 employees. And that's the largest in the United States. So it's one of the things where that's the believable part. Here's something that's old. Here's something that's not as old. And how do we push it together yeah that's that's the experimentation and that's what i love about it i suppose and this is why i'm learning so much i think from these particular groups and craftsmen because that's they seem to really hone in on that that very thing so they sort of how to integrate the old with the new with the dilapidated with the, the heavily weathered I suppose and hence the George Selios's of our world and the Jason Jensen's yeah. are the masters I just want to fill in a photo uh, I have a background in photography I, I went to school for journalism I worked for a newspaper I used to get into concerts for free drink for free uh, by photographing bands and you know never paid to go to a single concert went to them at least once a week for years so my thought is if I take a photo of my layout, I want you to kind of scratch your head and be like, is that real or not real? Obviously, I'm not there yet. i got a plywood empire. But, you know, when it's in its, quote-unquote, finished state. No, you're exactly right there. Um, and that's where, I think he touched on Lance Menheim before. His, yep. I don't know if you've read his book um, on... I have every single one he wrote. So just on how to set up scenes and, and the like. And he's very much, and I think George is exactly the same by the looks of it, but the photos that I've seen is we, I'm, I'm the same. Um, I need to learn the vertical. Because um, as soon as you start adding vertical to your, to your layout, I think, or a scene, I should say, whether it's a diorama or, or, or other, I think it seems to, really take off i think it just really starts to pop and in particular little details like power poles what we call them or utility poles in your part of the world um i know that there's some people that string cables between them and i've done that in one of my um finished areas of, of my layout and it just that it's just a wow factor so you sort of out of the way of the track and all that so you don't so you don't break break the cable but um so it's very interesting, yeah. Lance Minhine is obviously another one that's I need to go back and read his book actually. So it's really fantastic. So And any other element like lighting is important. I'm gonna get there eventually. Sound is important. I'm a h I've been to different layouts and I like when they have these push buttons and it plays a sound clip for thirty or sixty seconds. So I look at my layout as four separate modules, four separate themes. I'm gonna have a push button. And you're going to hear, a, you know, the boat horns and the seagulls and the waves. I'm going to have another push button. You're going to hear city traffic. And so each scene, when you're looking at it, you know, from your peripheral vision, you only see what's between here and here. You're, 
you feel so immersed into it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'm just trying to look up some photos of this Joseph Brandle. So just let me try a screen capture. So hang on. So everyone can see what we're talking to, talking about. Try to read this. Okay, let me go. Okay, let's. So, if I can actually, hopefully it'll bring it up. So I don't know how good that photo is. Is that, how large is that you're in, Dan? Is it seeable? Uh, credit card size. Yeah. Okay, I need to get a bigger one. Hang on. So this, as I said, this gentleman here is obviously one of my mentors, but um, he's more into the the scenery side of things more than anything. So, and it's all in German, so it's no good to me because I can't read German. I only know one. I went to Germany for a week. And all I learned was Ein Bier Bitte, which is a beer, please. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you get? A nice, um, a nice dunkel? No, nah, I can't bring yeah, it. Yeah, it, 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 we went in August of that year, and uh, the, the October Fest were already coming out. Yeah. It was a good time. Nah, it's... I should have looked a little bit further. No, nah, that's just a, a oh, forum no site. That's fine. Um, we digress as we do. Yeah, everyone, you know, everyone has their own thing that they're really into, and it's just about taking your passion and making it the best you can. Like, I'm a city kid. I grew up just outside of Boston. I spent a lot of my adult life living in Boston. Yeah. I live in the largest city in Maine, which is much smaller than Boston, but I'm just used to that. So, seeing, you know, having that believable feel um i know when my kids crashed this earlier johnny the older one he's nine he wants to make a layout and he just wants to do a subway system because he was born in boston he spent the first three years of his life there uh he rode the subways every single day so to him that's what's cool um i'm trying to model where we live we've only lived in maine for six years i'm definitely no expert on maine um uh, but it's just you know if this was a game of Sim City, and I could design where I live. How would I do it? Yeah, no, no, that's exactly right. So, um, so I vaguely remember on your Facebook, you're building. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming it's a scratch build, Santos Electronics. Yeah, uh, so tell, Santos. Tell yeah, so. That's actually, it's not a scratch build. It's actually an FOS kit. They sell three background buildings. Right. Um, I'm not ready to cut my own windows and doors, and I don't think I want to be ready to cut my own windows and doors. I'm really stoked that um, FOS, as well as some other people, are now just selling what they call scratch builder supplies, pre-cut walls. Because um, to me, that's the way the hobby is moving for me. You buy $100 worth of walls and windows, and doors, and then you're good for a year to just make whatever you can think of. Um, but I'm naming buildings after people know. There's definitely folks in this chat right now that I've named buildings after. I did Wiley and Sons uh, Premium uh, Hockey Sticks. Uh, I did that for the contest build after Brett and his dad. I'm doing Santos Electronics after my friend Nick Santo. Uh, I just met him in person last summer for the first time. We've been talking for years on the MRH forum and he has walked me through how to install a decoder from, you know, scratch and this is what you need to solder and this is what you need to wire and how to do the speakers and he's been such a great wealth of free knowledge. Um, so I'm like, I got to do something after him. Uh, Lynn McCurdy in the chat because he's the one who's always bringing up plastic kits. So McCurdy Plastics. Um, kind of like a little tongue-in-cheek joke about our uh, group of friends we get going on. Dave Cruzwick, um, you know, he's definitely helped me out with the hobby and, you know, also making it very inclusive by organizing pilgrimages to go see George Soros and play out. Um, so he's a big guy into signs. He's always sharing funny signs with everyone. So Cruzwick signs. No one says it better than Dave. Um, I'm still going to do more buildings after other people. 
every single person that I've talked about, um, pretty much everyone who's listened to this podcast, there will be a building named after you at some point. I just have to find more buildings. Um, Dan Raymond, I've met him once, but he is he's the world's expert on making HO scale automobile. So Raymond's hot rod. That's just like I gotta you know, gotta do a car shop named after him. Um, so whenever I can find the right building to name after someone, I've got a list of probably twenty guys I want to name buildings after. Uh, but also my family. So, you know, my dad, Benji's Eastern Hobbies, because he had the hobby store, Papa Chief Naval Surplus, because he was the chief in the Navy. Um, I started building that one before I decided to do the hobby store as well. So he'll get two buildings, but he got me in the hobby, so he deserves it. My son, Wyatt, who you saw earlier, Wyatt's Brain Freeze is an ice cream stand. Uh, Johnny's a bookworm, so there'll be a bookstore named after him. Uh, my grandmother is a huge foodie, and there's already an Ellen Miller's Diner, so that's easy because I can buy the kit, make it as is, and it's perfect for my grandmother, Eleanor. And, you know, I'll just keep going on and on and on. Um, so if there's anybody who's Facebook friends with me, and they're like, Dan, why didn't you name a kid after me yet? Don't be jealous. I will. I just haven't thought of something funny. And I know that some people in this hobby hate when buildings are named and they're like a joke, you know, a dad joke. And it's like, oh, that's such a stomach groaner. But I love that. I want all my buildings to be corny and cheesy, um, even if only a few people really get the inside joke. So I don't know what I'm going to do for you, Dazzy. Uh, we'll have to do something. We'll, we'll think something. Of something. I might, I'll have to do something, Pugach. So... We need to start behaving myself because I've just seen my wife, Nance Stance, is logged in. So she's saying, great job, fellas, listening in from the shack. So this, what we mean the shack is we've got a, a family's got a, 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 like a little house down near the ocean in the south of, uh, south of Adelaide, about an hour south of Adelaide. So uh, Brett Wiley, also your builds are turning out completely awesome, Dan, and I totally agree. I'm looking forward to... Uh, that, that Santos and I say so I fair to reiterate don't cut your own window because I did it on a scratch build and mine are real crooked so they are difficult to do yeah. so I am looking forward to once this virus goes away and we actually get stateside to come over with an empty suitcase Nancy I know you're listening in so mm -hmm. that will be happening so <laughs> I'll let you bring that softball bats that's fine so that's all the questions. I think we've sort of pretty well covered everything. Um, I, okay. The next one was where's the Breakwater Brats going, but I think we've sort of touched on that along the way okay. quite predominantly. So um, Lynn McCurdy is also, thank goodness she didn't name a, a manure pile after me. So maybe that could be yeah. something in the wow. pipeline. That would be funny. Maybe not manure pile. <laughs> It could be a waste treatment plant. McCurdy's, I don't know, McCurdy's Irish pub or something like that, if, if you're Irish. Apologise if you're not, Lynn. So that's all the questions I have for you, Dan. Okay. We're yeah, I, about I've an hour and a half a in. in. Well, we, should, we should get some questions for me asking you, because, you know, <clears throat> we've been chatting for a while on Facebook, but this is the first time we actually heard each other's voices and saw each other's faces. Correct. Um... So yeah, let's start with the, some of the ones that I gave you a heads up on a couple of days ago. Um, I know your viewers know you and your railroad a bit. They probably know you better than I do because uh, I've only really been following you since about December. Um, so, you know, let's throw some hard-hitting questions at you. The pressure is on. Let's go. Um, you know, you mentioned working on your railroad with your dad when he was a little bit younger. How'd you get into model railroading? Yeah. Obviously, you weren't born into it like I was or Brett was. No. Well, I sort of was, I suppose. My, As I touched on, my grandpa lived on the, the the main line between Adelaide and Melbourne. So he was just like maybe 20 minutes out of Adelaide along it. So we often used to, as I'm talking like young tech, like four and five years of age. Um, they lived literally across the road. So we used to go and watch the trains go by. Um, so we're talking early 80s I suppose here or late very late 70s so with that he had a quite a large model railway which was all predominantly American at that point in time 
because that's all you could get here in Australia was American stock, and it was a lot of Santa Fe um, type stock. So he used to he had this little prop bit in the middle that I used to be able to crawl underneath the bench work and then prop up underneath it, and I could watch the trains go around for hours apparently. So that's my introduction into it, I suppose. And then we moved away interstate for my father's job um, and I didn't sort of get back into trains until maybe I was 11 or 12 with my my best mate um, who is probably listening in I would think knowing him so he'll pop up at some stage so he had a very sort of a, a probably four by eight layout in his bedroom so from there I got back in or I got in back into the hobby I suppose and bought my first locomotive which was European at that point in time, hence why I'm probably into European modelling now. But and then it's just grown from a little thing to an absolute obsession, as it is now. Everything yeah. is obsession based with me, so everything's based around my train. And I'm assuming my lovely wife, who was probably sitting back, yes, it is an obsession. She'll put some smart Alec comment up at some stage, I'm sure, how much of an obsession yeah. it is. But, but she, I'm very, very lucky there. So I'm, I have to thank her. She's very understanding for my hobby and the amount of time and effort and that goes into to this, and obviously the the money as well. It's not a cheap hobby as, as we've touched on. So that's me in a nutshell. It is not. In every hobby, I bet you you're in the same position I was. Um, I'm always all in for anything I do. So it doesn't matter what your hobby is; it gets expensive real quick. Um, I'm going to go with some of these questions out of order because I think they flow better. You mentioned earlier when we were chatting in the very, very beginning, almost two hours ago, about your kids being involved. Um, how involved are they now in the model railroad? You know, so you got your daughter who's basically our sound engineer at the mixing board right now. That's correct. So she's sitting back in in our lounge room, listening in, and every now and again she'll come in. Oh yeah, your voice is cutting out every now and again, but. That's just my internet, unfortunately. So um, they're in it to a certain degree. I think my lad Tom, who's just sitting over my, my my shoulder here, he's the one that's flicking between all these scenes here on a external application. So he, I think he really likes the tech side of things. But my daughter, she's an artiste, so to speak. So I think she's she just hit me up the other day because my dad is eyesight's failing as I touched on before with his with his health and the like that he's he used to paint all our figures prize of figures and he's painted thousands of these things over the years so i went down there and collected all the paint brushes and about 100 pots of humble paint so i just made a comment literally when we picked that oh, i have to teach my daughter how to paint some figures and she's been into me ever since then that she wants to start painting figures and i'm i'm sort of glad for that because I have no interest in doing that. So I'm trying to get the kids into it slowly, but obviously they've got their their um, vocations they like as well, like their dance and, and the likes. So. Yeah, it's important to find something they're good at, but something they like as well. I love painting prizer figures myself. Um, right above me, which is why there's like this, it's not a heavenly glow. It's just I'm sitting inches away from two fluorescent bulbs, but I'll paint my figures and I'll, looking over my glasses and I'm painting with a toothpick or even a safety pin as my paintbrush. And I don't know. It's relaxing. Come downstairs, nine o'clock at night, stay down here till midnight or so, just painting one figure. And it's just satisfying. So if you need figures painted and uh, she doesn't like to do it, <laughs> we'll have to have a painting party. Painting party. You fix so my... You fix my... my you fix my decoder and I'll okay. get you some figures. We'll have a virtual painting party. I like the sound of that. That's funny. So, yeah. Lynn McCurdy, great scene and hearing you guys. Thanks, Lynn. He's obviously been uh, chiming in a fair bit. And same as Dave and Brett Wiley. So, he's sort of asked what's up next for both of your layouts. Um, so, that's sort of in your line of questioning there, Dan? Or Yeah, absolutely. So, sorry for the guys with the chat. Um, I'm not as receptive to it as Dazzy is because my vision's horrible. I'm 38 years old. I'll be 39 in two weeks and I have the eyes of an 80-year-old. So how do I paint prizer figures is beyond me. Um, so I'm literally like kissing the laptop to read your chat sometimes. Um, 
But anyway, I digress. Uh, yeah, my layout, we talked extensively, and I'll recap a little bit for Brett, but right now I'm questioning Dazzy. So, Dazzy, what's going on with your layout? You, you've got the harbor scene you mentioned earlier, your building. You, ha- you want, you know, two copies of every American structure, just like I do. Yeah. One, one to build and one to build for someone that you know and just give it to them as a piece of yeah. yourself. Um, so, so, yeah. I suppose where my layout is at, um, it's taking a little bit of a back seat the last probably few months due to my YouTube and the like. But um, I'm, I, I try to get out there. I was just out there yesterday. I'm not running my train, so to speak, but I'm building a... I live on a rural property on a dirt road, so it gets rather dusty. So what I'm trying to do is build a, a false roof over the top of it so you can imagine a structure then i'm building a roof within the layout that's only uh i'm six foot two in height so this might be about six foot five to give you some sort of idea roof i've done it on some parts of it um you might see some of the footage that's currently on that so that's over my my yard so um so you can just see probably in the background there some blue that's sort of the backdrop so i'm sort of building building that roof and i just so i'm using like a, a product called mdf um i'm not, not sure what if there's something similar in your your neck of the woods so that's what i'm doing i painted it sort of like a sky blue color and then i'll totally encapsulating the layout and it comes up really nicely because it almost picture frames the whole layout so to speak but what it also does it keeps the dust off where i can pull tarpaulins over the front of it and keep the dust right off it so i'm being working quite hard at um doing that so no yeah we definitely have mdf all our uh i call it cheap furniture target ikea etc is often made out of that and having some kind of roof over your layout is huge uh, i ended up throwing plywood sheets up on the ceiling above my layout because my house is 100 years old and it's old hardwood floors and so much stuff from upstairs comes right down. Like, if right above my layout is the uh, living room sofa, and all the, everyone's always hanging out up there, and if someone spilt a drink, it would drip on my layout. So I had to do something very similar. All right, let's see. What else I got for you? Uh, oh, here's a good one, because I don't know this. Um, how did you come up with the name and the concept for Fallen Log Railway? Okay, uh, Fallen Rock Railway is obviously the name of my my current layout. So, just to let you know, all this footage that you're seeing in the background is not actually my layout. Some of it is. Um, that's uh, my local model railroad show that was. I took some footage last year. Um, so, where did I come up with the name? When my wife and I bought the property that we currently live at, um, to give you some sort of idea, it's about three acres of land up in up in the hills, you know, um, south of Adelaide. So once we had handover of the land from the bank, so to speak, so all the, the finances and all that went through, we had like a little bit of party, mind you. Before that, it was cow paddock. So we live over the back from a dairy, a local dairy. So they just grazed cows for many years. So we all were, the whole family sort of included my wife's grandparents and my wife's grandpa, uh, late grandpa, rest his, uh, his soul. Um, came up with, he goes, look at all the fallen, fallen logs on this place. There's a lot of firewood you got here. So I think, you know, from that day forward, I didn't think of any other names. That was that was it. It was Fallen Log Railway or that was was nothing. So um, so that's sort of how we, how I came about the name. It was just as simple as that. I didn't lament over it. As soon as he said it, it was just the sort of defining moment. That's what my railway is going to be called. So... That's awesome. I really like that. I just realized I'm a horrible co-host, and I didn't answer the question for uh, Brett, um, because he came a little bit later. So, Brett, uh, pretty much to recap, what's going next to my layout is structures, structures, structures. I have bought more trains than I need. I started by buying all my trains before I had bench work, and now I need to crank out anywhere from... 20 to 50 structures before I can really do anything else. Thankfully, I got about a dozen already here in the basement. Um, but I'm going to basically just be 
going through every last bottle of wood glue that Home Depot has uh, for the next couple of years. All right. So next question. And yeah, uh, I actually used to be a co-host of a podcast. I used to be a co-host of a beer podcast, um, Great Beer Adventure. And I interviewed at breweries every Tuesday and drank for free. It was a great job, but it didn't pay. Um, and then I had to get a real job in that cubicle, so that ended. Uh, but because I used to be so heavily into beer, and I still am, but not like I used to be, just curious, what is your favorite type of beer? Oh, favorite beer. It would have to be craft brew. Um, we have a a brewery up here or in South Australia called the Lobethal Beer House. So to give you some sort of idea, the sort of the, the inner southern hills has a real German heritage um, from its settlement back in the day. So it's very German orientated type beer. Um, so that would have to be my favourite brewery and they have probably nearly a dozen beers. I would, Depending on the time of the year, um, we're coming into our cooler climate now and you're coming out of yours so i'd be looking at dunkels and that sort of heavier maltier type beer so um right the way through to a sort of a a summer type beer they, they do a lovely red ale as well so that would be my favorite brewery and different types of beer so they've as i said i could drink any of their beer nice um i prefer the darker beers uh, a joke i used to always say and sometimes I get in trouble for it, sometimes I don't, is uh, I like my beer like my women, stout and bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can answer uh, that because my wife might yeah. be listening to this, but yeah. I like but I sweet. love stout. Stouts are my favorite. When I started drinking beer, I drank Guinness only for the first, like, two years that I could legally drink. Uh, St. Patty's Day is coming around the corner, um, which is always good. Uh, I'm really into this beer uh, mast landing is a local brewery there are two towns west of me and they make a beer called gunner's daughter it is a stout that tastes like a reese's peanut butter cup it's amazing yeah of course i've had cock milk dave what kind of question is that um Yeah, so coffee milk for me, I grew up in Massachusetts, in the southern part of Massachusetts, um, and coffee milk was invented, at least I know, I could be completely wrong, someone could Wikipedia check me, um, but coffee milk, as far as I know, was invented in Rhode Island, the next state over, and we grew up drinking autocrat coffee milk, where you get this syrup, which is kind of like you get chocolate syrup. Uh, but it's coffee syrup, and you would pour it in milk. And as a kid, I would get a pint glass and fill it with milk, put in the coffee syrup, mix it. It tastes exactly like coffee ice cream, if anyone's had coffee ice cream. Uh, one of my favorite breweries is actually one of the older breweries in this country. It's not the best beer, I'll be honest, but I love Narragansett beer. Um, for anyone who's not from New England, you're probably like, what's Narragansett beer, and why does Dan always talk about it? Have you seen the movie Jaws? You saw when he crushes that can in his hand? That's a can of Narragansett right there. Um, and they do a coffee milk stout with the autocrat coffee syrup that I grew up with. Um, so you're drinking a beer that tastes like coffee ice cream, and it's awesome. So it is a little bit. That's, that's fantastic. I'll have to try to remember yeah. next time. So... Dave Cruzwick said, sorry, we don't have it here. So he's definitely missing out. Uh, I love ice coffee. Well, 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 I call Dave, ice coffee or coffee milk. So um, anyone out in the chat, yeah, are they hearing me okay? Because my daughter's just come in saying we might not be hearing my, my voice. I hear you fine. Um, what about the chat, guys? No worries. But yeah, no, co coffee milk, I could see how I, like, things could be different. I get that. 
But Dave, we will definitely get you some uh, coffee milk next time you come to visit because it is a wonderful thing. It is just now I want some. <laughs> yeah, I know. The first is for another ninety minutes. It's a um probably a little bit later for you now. It's just coming up at eleven o'clock over here, so. Yeah, eight twenty-five. Excellent. Uh, I'll tell you, for you yesterday, a pretty good day. Yeah. Um. But yeah, any coffee beer too was good. I, I gave I, Brett. I think I've had coffee beer. You haven't had coffee beer? Ah, oh, it's kind of like how you have coffee milk. So I gave Brett and Dad a bunch of Maine beers when I saw them uh, in person last summer, and one of them is I'm pretty sure I gave him. If I didn't, I, I'll have to. It's called Jolly Woodsman, and it's made by Banded Horn Brewery. Banded Horn is like 30 minutes south of me, and they take a stout, and they put a espresso in it. It's just that simple. Wow. You'd be buzzing after that, I would think. Mm -hmm. And it only comes in tall boys, 16-ounce cans. So we'll do another call out here so someone else has just come on uh tar hill railroads um i obviously i put a call out saying they're hearing us fine now so i don't know what happened there we must have dropped out something so i wonder if that's uh i wonder if that's scott or i don't i don't know what scott's calling his uh railroad he's in one of the carolinas and if i get if i get it wrong he'll get mad at me and dave cruise week hopefully george is in june so unfortunately not for me yeah I'm hoping it happens, and if it doesn't happen in June, it will happen at some point. And, you know, I know for a lot of you guys, you have to fly to go there. For me, I drive an hour. It's literally halfway from my house to my parents' house. I drive past George's monthly. Uh, but it would be nice to stop, actually stop and hang out with you guys. I might have to get a, get you to get a photo for me, or, or 300. Or 300, exactly. <laughs> I um, do enjoy... Uh... Uh, no, Tar Heel Railroads is an Alan. His name's Alan. Ah, cool. Welcome, welcome, Alan. Welcome. Welcome aboard. The crazy train. So, what's your favorite... Darren, what's your favorite part of the hobby? Do you like the building? Do you like the research? The operations? Like, why do you do it? I... The reason I do it is because this hobby has so many aspects I don't think any other hobby has. It has carpentry, which I'm no carpenter. It has electronics, I'm definitely not an electrician. There's scenery, there's photography, research, as you say. Oh, I, the list could go on. Um, I think that's probably why I like it so much. And you listen, it's common threads, and I'm, I'm assuming I'm not the only one, but how many different projects you got going on at any given time so i don't think i could probably nail it down i have one particular thing i like to do it goes through stages you asked me probably a year ago would have been dcc and electronics because that was me trying to wire up my um my staging yard right now it's woodwork and building craftsman kits and thinking about scenery and topography and the like so so probably in short, I don't probably have one bit like what's your top five craftsman kits. Um, yeah. I, I, I couldn't narrow it down, I don't think. So right now it's the carpentry side of things. Not saying I'm any good at it, but it's what I'm, I'm enjoy doing because um, carpent building your baseboards and doing scenery definitely and building kits are definitely three aspects that is visual and you can definitely see how much progress you're making in a layout so i'm a firm believer that if you're seeing progress on the layout it sort of spurs you on to do different things but you know then you're doing wiring underneath the board if you have a look it looks like some sort of chicken has gone under there and nested it's just like a nest of wires going everywhere but um so you don't see the the, the untrained eye i suppose the how much work is actually goes underneath the layout um for the type of layout that i'm building anyway so Absolutely. That's great. Um, oh, this is the hard question. If you could start over completely from scratch, so we're talking new layout room, new trains, new team, new everything, what would you do? Oh, 
that is a hard question. I know. Everyone who ever gets this question on any podcast really oh, can't I, answer it. I probably would... Okay, if I was going to do a whole new room, I would make the room smaller and I would have it some sort of reverse pressure on it to start with <laughs> to keep all the dust out. <laughs> Obviously, if, if, if money is no limit here... Um, mm-hmm. The layout would probably be half the size. Just purely because I'm enjoying the detailed side of the hobby right now. And I think I think the smaller the layout, the more detail you got. Because obviously the small the more detail is the more time. So I'm not saying it would be a, a small, small layout, but it'd be a lot smaller than it is now. So that's probably what I would do. Um Oh, regards to rolling stock and locomotives and locale. Being I have a rather large American influence right now, I probably would look at... It'd still be steam. I, I like steam. That's that's a given. I'd probably be... Oh, some sort of logging layout, I would think. I, I think... Um, something on those lines. I've got a very little logging facility on my layout now, but I probably would go the logging route, I would think, for some reason. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree. I, I would do the exact same thing, a logging layout. Um, I was never in, really into steam, but it's grown on me over, over the past couple of years. And I almost did a Thomas layout, but I knew that they would outgrow it. And even though I like Thomas, at some point, I would just get sick of Thomas 365 days a year. Um, but, uh, you know, dabbling in steam and doing logging. It's the, and everyone seems to just be going smaller, which, you know, I talked about every time I redid my layout, it got smaller and smaller. And it went from half a basement to a bookshelf. I think that's an interesting point you raise because yeah. um, on another podcast that I listened to, the AML Network one uh, with Lionel and, and Co. They had a whole podcast just based just around that. That our time and space, I suppose, is limited. Um, we our houses in Australia are definitely not built like we don't have basements like you. So we build outhouses or other um, like, like a, a galvanized iron shed, effectively. While I've got mine in, but um, I think. Building, we're also time a lot more time poor, I think. So, to be able to build something and add the detail that I think, particularly where I'm, where I'm heading now with the craftsman kit side of things, is you can't do that in a in a basement empire. Um, we'll take George Silios out of this because I think it's a reasonably large layout. It's not it's not massive by what I'm told, but. Mind you, I've only seen photos of it, which make it look uh, probably a lot larger than it really is. Would that, would that is that a fair comment, Dan? Or I think it's massive, but yeah. I've seen bigger layouts for yeah. sure. Um, but I've never seen layouts that can be quality. No, so I, I would think that um, the basement empires, as at Rock Model Railroad, are sort of used to put in their magazine I, I think they're they're more few and far between these days i would think they're obviously they're still out there um i think people are more going for the basement um you know the, the shelf layouts like yourself which is you know whatever floats your boat i don't i'm willing to listen to anyone about their modeling techniques and what they like yeah. what they don't like it's that's i think the beauty of this hobby i think we've got something to learn from everyone um mm-hmm. Maybe Jason's not learning much from me, and nor probably Todd and Brett, but hey, maybe they are. No, nope. they are, <laughs> and that is kind of, the, that is the coolest part, is when you do something, and then the people you look up to are like, that's really awesome, I never thought of that. Um, it's not on there now, I'd have to find the photo, but, you know, this pop build I did, I never saw HO scale blue tarps, and I made one with some blue plastic, uh, it just wasn't what I liked, so I took it off. 
Uh, but I was like, oh, if I'm going to have a roof that's missing some tar paper, you need to put a blue tarp on that. I use plastic from packaging of plaid brand paintbrushes. Uh, so you never know. You're, you're gonna you're gonna find the people you look up to are one day gonna be looking up to you for sure. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So I, I got a few last questions. I know it's getting late. Right now it's eight thirty-five my time. So maybe we can wrap it up in the next like twenty um, for tonight. We've just taken um, two hours, so. Woo! Well, right, that makes us like <laughs> official, right? Like anything yeah, under two, two hours. hours doesn't count. Well, that's in the podcast world, it definitely is. So, and I know oh, yeah. poor old Brett and, Brett and Todd get a, a hammering if it's anything under two hours for a podcast now. But I, I can I understand it's. I mean, I've gone through a liter and a half of water so far, and my voice is getting hoarse. So I, I feel for those boys now. So absolutely. Uh, so, what's popular with the other modelers around you? Um, is everyone else doing pretty much the same thing, European scene, uh, or the other guys in the club doing something completely different? Um, okay, so my local hobby store, which is down near Adelaide in South Australia, is predominantly, he sells predominantly German stuff. That's probably why I've got more. It's just easy for me to get. However, he does have a fair bit of uh, American stuff as well, but of note, he has recently gone into South Australian railways and Australian railways, and he's going and building his own. He's made his own brand out of it. So, if you go to this, the Eastern States, um, obviously, the, the the train shows there. Most of them, it's sort of Australian based. Probably no, not too dissimilar to. Obviously, a lot of your train shows are probably all American-based, so we're exactly the same. There's some really, really awesome products that come are coming out of China, relatively cheap now, that are ready to run, and they are Mickey Mouse, and really, they run really nicely. So, uh, before that, obviously, Australian modelers were having to kit bash American stock. So, even though South Australia heritage back in the 1940s. Um, an American gentleman came out and revitalized our railways effectively. So, so we had a very so our steam engines of that era do have a, a very big American flair to them. So, yeah, no, definitely. Like, I find where I am in uh, Portland, Maine, there's a lot of young modelers. Like, you know, I'm considered young in the hobby, but I'm actually middle aged and for my local area. Um, there's still a lot of guys in their 20s. Uh, they're pretty much all doing modern, like present day, uh, intermodal. Obviously, I um, said earlier, I'm a thousand feet from the intermodal facility and for the prototype. Um, so we're doing huge container yards, um, a lot of auto rack trains. They're doing local, like the older guys, you know, like the 40 to 60 year olds, they're all doing. Um, similar to me, Main Central, Bangor, Roostick, all these train companies that went out of business in the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, before other companies bought them over and whatnot. A lot of Canadian stuff. Uh, I'm, still, I'm not that close to Canada. I know it may have seemed that way, but I'm still probably a six-hour drive to Canada. Um, but I find Canadian uh, stuff is very, very popular where I live. Um, and I feel like because I model the 1970s and 80s, I'm an outlier um, to the rest of the people who hang out at the local shop. Uh, let's see what else I got. Uh, we talked about influential. Um, we never really talked about um, why you started a YouTube channel. I knew that was coming. So just... <laughs> Everyone can have a look on the screen that's going out now to give you some sort of idea. That's the Australian, more Australian, well, that's European, but the, the, the video before um, was if you have a look at some of the flair of that, that was very much American. Uh, why did I get into YouTube? Um, probably because I was watching so much YouTube to learn, I felt that being a lone wolf modeler and as like you, Dan, you pointed out that 
So that's South Australian there. Um, that video anyway. So um, being the lone wolf modeler sort of that I am, but I do have quite a number of what I would call mentors that are quite a bit older than me. There's one gentleman that comes up very regularly, um, at least sort of once a month to come and help me build my layout. Um, he's obviously, his skills are, are phenomenal. So I suppose the reason why I got back into it, I think every modeler for this hobby to grow and continue to grow and be maintained has to pass on their knowledge and skills to others. So I'm not saying I am an expert at anything that I do regarding model railroading. However, I'm started up my channel to show people my skills. So I got into the craftsman kit scene, which is sort of my latest type of videos that I've been building is showing that, you know what, I'm a rank amateur when it comes to building these kits. However, I want to show someone that with a little bit of mouse, they can be done to a reasonable standard. I'm, I'm quite happy with where I'm at after only a few few Craftsman kit builds where before that, you know, I, I remember looking at Craftsman kits and the commentary around Craftsman kit was, oh, you, you know, they're, they're there for the experts, they're for the fine modeler type, type scenario. You know, well, okay, so they sort of put you off a little bit. So I wanted to sort of videotape or put that out to the world that if someone like me from a little backwater in South Australia can model something like that to a to a reasonable standard why wouldn't I want to show that so that's me paying back my mentors as well because I you know it's it gets to this at the point that there's not much probably I'm, you can't we can everyone's got something to learn from everyone but particularly these gentlemen that I felt that I had to do my bit for the hobby as well so here I am that's hence the inception of modern railroad techniques as a as a YouTube channel and and Facebook site and web and a website so I love that and I appreciate everyone who does YouTube um, because you're giving away knowledge for free you know in the old days when you and I were teenagers we would have to buy the videotape if we wanted to learn these things um, so the fact that everyone's sharing and participating is huge. And I'm so, so thankful. Yeah, I know, my basement so hideous and ugly, but it is what it is. Uh, but just, yeah, the fact that you do this is awesome because you don't have to. You, you know, like you, I know what it's like. I used to do a geocaching podcast for a couple of years. It was easier when I had one kid instead of two. Uh, and it you know, putting out those weekly or bi-weekly videos, it takes a lot of time and, a, and, you know, sometimes you're not motivated to do it. So just know that everyone's thankful. They may not comment, but the fact that people take the time to watch, it's making an impact on the hobby. Uh, and that kind of leads into the next one of what's the future of model railroad techniques? Can you hear me now, Dan? Is that better? Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, Modeler's Journal. So I've been approached by another a Facebook site that I'm a member of to possibly looking at writing an article about right. my model train journey. So at this point in time, I'm just working with the editor because I'm not much of an author myself, as my, my wife would attest to that, um, to putting an article together around 1,000 words, 1,200 words, which I'm sort of at now. So which is pretty well just on paying what I'm another article that I put on my website or a blog called Paying It Forward, which I touched on before. So it's just more of a formalized version of that. So I suppose that's me branching out. It's still, I believe, doing something quite noble for this hobby, uh, getting information out there, telling people my journey, um, the ups and downs of this hobby, as you well know. So that's probably... Modoro techniques as if we can coin a phrase a brand I suppose that YouTube is one part of it my website and then I'm branching out into you able to hear me now Lynn? 
Yeah, Lynn said he can't hear you. I can still hear you. Ah, sounds back. Cool. All right. So, might be having right. some buffering issues I need to look into. So, yeah. Um, so, Lynn, the problem is, Lynn, that, you know, that cable that goes from Australia to California, it's super long. And that's right. Maybe and it's a... upside down. It's probably stretched. Maybe it's got the yeah. virus. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, uh, that's what I'm moving into more, you know, putting putting it to paper, I suppose, in a magazine, yeah. electronic ebook type scenario now. So see where that journey takes me. So It's super cool. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, let me know. Uh, I've self-published before. I did take it down um, because no one proofread my work. Uh, it was kind of funny. My mom was poking fun at me last weekend where when I wrote my novel, I... Uh, when I signed it and gave her a copy, I said, um, maybe you'll proofread the next one. Yeah, my wife um, but, proofreads my stuff, that's for sure, all my text, because, as I said, I'm not an author. But maybe I will put it via you to have a look over. Well, no, so. yeah, but I mean, more like if you're looking to self-publish and go down oh, that road. Okay. I've done Creative Space, which is owned okay. by Amazon, and that's what Lance Mannheim uses. Yep. I'm familiar with it, and it's a super slick process. So but, yeah, fear and help. So Tar Heel Railroads or Allen, uh, YouTube has improved my modeling skills a hundred percent since my early days in the mid seventies. I totally agree. Since I've been getting into to YouTube, I think hundred percent definitely I've grown as a modeler. And you gotta see it too. Like I love podcasts. It's podcasts are my favorite medium. I subscribe to a good dozen podcasts. I love books. I have hundreds of books. But a video, you learn so much more from watching a YouTube video than you will reading a magazine, reading a book, or listening to somebody. No, I totally agree with that. Um, I think every media has its its good points and its bad points, obviously. Um, yeah. to, to learn a tutorial, I think besides actually putting together which is sometimes horrendously difficult and getting and camera angles and all that right but if they come out come out correctly um you can learn a lot so i'm about to do a, a youtube video with a an indian fella um in he models um american engage and he scratch builds everything mm -hmm. because he can't get the products so um you might have seen him around on a few his name's gustav Chat chatterjee um, from mm -hmm. dioramas, he makes those beautiful trees. I don't know if you saw that. That's just he takes like twelve hours to build a tree. It's just phenomenal. So I've sort of initially reached out to him to say, "Hey, do you want to do a collaboration type thing?" Because that's seems to be the the next step for me to to start sharing this hobby. And he sort of, yeah, no worries. So we that's what we're looking at doing coming up, and we're going to build a, a little boat. I won't go into go into it too much, but watch this space on that one. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, I just love what everyone's doing for, you know, the YouTube channels or hanging, having a chat like this. I know we've been talking about doing this for a few months now, um, Facebook Live, et cetera. You know, it's just, just being comfortable with yourself and being willing to share. I know when I did a Facebook Live, uh, I was trying to show how I paint graffiti and I just made mistake after mistake and it came out horrible. And it was not like I normally do it. Um, and that was just the jitters, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. But making the way I look at that, making those mistakes is very relevant as well, because obviously you learn from that. Because um, all we see is the finished product, and I'm sure mm -hmm. every modeler who puts a YouTube, and I'm no, I'm no different. Some of the like my tar paper roof case in point, it looked like a hunk of rock that I put up there. It just looked terrible. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I think people need to see the mistakes as well as the triumphs. That's that's what I, I strongly believe as well. Exactly. Well, that's all the questions I have. Are there any questions from our wonderful audience? We'll put it out there. Um, anyone there out in YouTube land got any more questions for us? And then we might wrap this up because we're coming up two hours and 14 minutes, Dan. For two, two blokes that have never met each other, I think we've done pretty well. Yeah, 
not too, not too shabby. We survived. We survived. You know? I think... We did good. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but I would like, you know, to move on and maybe do others because I think the way the world is becoming, particularly the, the coming two or three months, um, we might become more and more lone modelers because no one's going to be having train shows by the looks of it in your country and mine. So I think these types of catch-ups are going to be very relevant and quite exciting and we can still, um, you know, get together and share our ideas. But in a, let's yeah, put that in I, a, think it's, I think it's super important to document stuff and have this community. Um, you know, it, it, it's going to be an interesting uh, year this year. Yeah, I think I'm so. hoping that it goes short, but you never know. Um I don't, I don't know how severe lockdowns are. You're neck of the woods, but, you know, work yeah. told us on Friday afternoon we got to work from home till further notice. Some schools are closed. My kids still have school on Monday. I canceled Scout um, into, for six weeks, and then we'll reassess on May 1st yeah. to see about that. So, yeah, just keep in touch with people because, you know, we're going to go stir crazy, and we're not going to... So. Yeah. You know, we're going to snap at our spouses, and we're going to need to just kind of take a deep breath and know that we're not alone in this and that someone halfway across the world you're in tomorrow you're you're a time traveler and that's right. you're going through the same nonsense that i'm going through that's right that's right so just a few more shout outs we've got graham stockfield has just joined and he's given us a little sad emoji because i think he's just heard that we're going to finish now graham i'll put it out to you have you got any questions for us but just before we do take that graham just quickly i will be I'm obviously recording this, hopefully, um, and I'll put this up on YouTube for the whole world to see, Dan, if you're happy with that. So it, I'm hoping this okay. is I'm hoping this is recording. If not, anyway. So if not, we got to do it all again, and all the same people have to come in at the same time and ask the same questions. Yeah. Ah, oh, well. So, Lynn McCurdy, <laughs> both did a great job. Thanks, Lynn. I really appreciate your input. That's been fantastic. Uh, Dave Cruisewick, good show, guys. Thanks, Dave, uh, for coming along and inputting to, to this and Tar Heel Railroads as well. Uh, Graham Stockfield, we're going to the Easter show in Diamond Creek, which is in Melbourne. Um, he sort of He's also asked, have there any shows been cancelled in Adelaide? Uh, we don't have too many shows here in Adelaide, Graham. We've got one around June, long weekend, I think, which is sort of very early June. So we'll see how that, that pans out, but we're still a few months off, so... Um, their um, show got Alan's got a tip yeah so Alan put in the uh, chat um, when it gets stressful grab a beer and go to the workbench and that is why I have a beer bottle opener on it physically attached to my workbench that's um, that's awesome because you need it yeah definitely do I think uh, Todd Wiley put it up yesterday on his Facebook that he is quarantining himself to the bench for the next 48 hours so mm -hmm. I can't see any issues with that so, yep. so well, I think all in sundry everyone. has enjoyed. So um, to everyone out there that's been listening, we've sort of hovered between eight, nine, ten viewers, which is I think pretty fantastic for two amateurs. Well, I'm an amateur. You've done podcasts before, but um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, literally, it was a little bit stressful to start with because we had a little a few glitches, didn't we? We couldn't contact we contacted each other initially you went and had dinner with the family came back then we couldn't get in contact with each other again i'm thinking i'm gonna have to sing for two hours and no one needs to hear that that's for sure yeah i turned off my uh, bluetooth headphones for 45 minutes and i come back and then we sounded like dialects in a uh, doctor who and then i ended up rebooting my computer we couldn't get connected it was a mess but yeah. we did it and you know it's going to be fun. Like I, I hope to do it again, but I also want to, uh, it's your show and I want to see and hear uh, other cool people you talk to. Who knows? Like yeah. I used to have a YouTube channel. Maybe I'll have one again. And Bob Johnson is constantly pushing me to get back into the YouTube world. He asked yeah. me almost weekly, when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Well, the way I look at this, Dan, I think the way we've sort of hit off here and the, you know, we've got, I wasn't expecting too many people were listening. To be quite honest with you, I, I don't know. And we've got a whole, we've got pages and pages of comments here that I think that's probably something I'd love to t reach out the, the the Dan and Dazzy uh, Variety Hour or something like that. And we'll do a little <laughs> tap dance maybe next time. So we can do it. We can do it. 
can do that. So that would be good. Do a little jig. So for the use of those right, that well, don't know Dan, um, he's obviously got his Facebook, uh, Breakwater Branch Railroad. So go and have a look at that. Obviously, I've got my YouTube model railroad techniques and also Facebook and website. If you just go Googling it, you'll be able to find it. So I've had an absolute ball doing this. Um, as I said, we're coming up two hours, 20 minutes, 11.25 a.m. in the morning here. It's been emotional. It's been fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of this. That's That's been, been great. And some really cool questions that have come in as well. So... Until the next time. We'll see you next Keep time. On on, guys. Yeah.